One thing that 2020 has taught us is just how dangerous fact-checking is. Mainstream media's stunning reversal on whether COVID could have been created in a Chinese lab is a prime example of that. For most of the past year, left-wing media consensus was that the lab leak argument was just a fringe theory promoted by people on the right, and big tech insisted these, quote, conspiracies should be censored on social media platforms. Well, they were wrong. It's blatantly obvious nobody is fact-checking the fact-checkers. That much we know for sure. Our next guest says it's time that changed. Columnist for the Federalist, David Marcus, with me now, a man who was willing to ask questions during the pandemic. The kind of questions, David, that get you banned. And then there's, there's no apology afterwards from the people that said that you were a danger to the public, right? There's, there's no social media note from Facebook saying, sorry that we censored you. Turns out it was our bad. No, not only that. I mean, there's also no check in the mail uh, for all the revenue that these companies lose, that these news outlets lose because they get erroneously suppressed by Facebook. And it's not even Facebook that's doing it. Um, Facebook hires these third party fact checking entities uh, to make this call for them because they don't want to be viewed as a publisher themselves. Um, and, And these third party fact checking entities there is no regulation. There are no rules. And so uh, it really has a horrible effect on our discourse because time and again, not just the the Lab League story, but the Hunter S. Biden story. Um, John Tierney has a piece uh, in City Journal right now about a piece he ran about masks being bad for kids uh, that got suppressed because of these fact checkers. And he was citing a peer reviewed study. So, I mean, some, something has to be done because the American people are being badly misled. Yeah, we need to know who is making these decisions. There needs to be accountability for that going forward, at least. And part of the problem here is that they're either, as you you mentioned, outsourced to fact-checking organizations, which are just left-wing propaganda organs. I mean, that's very clear from anyone who understands who staffs these things and what the politics are of the people who work there. But even beyond that, you know, it, it seems to me like we should at least get some transparency from Facebook, from Google, from Twitter, about who who's making these decisions because until there's yeah. actually some until there's actually some uh, downside to it reputationally you know you can just still work at twitter and get away with this stuff because no one knows who actually made the call i feel like we've got to force their hand david and, and this is beyond just the break up the monopolist in big tech which also needs to happen yeah i mean we also need to have a conversation about what constitutes a fact check um because a lot of times it's not fact checking, it's opinion checking, it's tone checking, it's social responsibility checking. And honestly, uh, one of the reasons that I think it wouldn't be difficult to regulate third party fact checkers is because fact checks should be really simple, right? Facts are supposed to be stubborn. They should be two sentences long. They should be, here's what you asserted and here's what shows that, that what you asserted is not a fact. Not that we find it misleading, Not that we think you took something out of context, but factually you got something wrong. And that's not what's going on here. And also we see that that they assert, I mean, you're you're pointing out, but they assert that something that can be considered to be even unfinished or, or, you know, inconclusive, there's only one approved narrative for it. I mean, that's where we get into the Wuhan lab situation where really nobody was ever saying they knew, or I should say it wasn't really the opinion uh, broadly speaking, of those who thought it probably came from a lab that they were 100% sure, they weren't even allowed on these platforms to say that the preponderance of the evidence indicates to me that this is the likeliest that, that was suppressed, which is just mind-blowing. Yeah, and, and it has a chilling effect. I mean, can, these can, you know, conservative outlets, I'm not talking about the New York Post or, or Fox News, but I'm talking about the smaller outlets, the one that the ones that bring us the violent images from Portland, the ones that find out stuff about critical race theory, these outlets, you know, they can't afford to have their views suppressed. And so, uh, you know, what they what they do is they will have factual information that they don't run, that they have to choose not to run because they can't run the risk of losing this revenue. I mean, th- it, it has to stop. Uh, that, that's a much more common occurrence than I think people realize. And in terms of just the, the general 
accountability for the media during this whole fiasco, David. I mean, a part of this that I think was was very troubling was as this was happening, not only were there not voices in a lot of the big establishment journo enterprise out there, New York Times, Washington Post, we all know what they are, CNN, raising even raising concerns about the blatant censorship that you and I are talking about, they were cheering it on. They were actively rooting for this. Well, yeah, because all the rules stop, right? I mean, whoever thought that, that in the United States of America, people would not be allowed to go to church for months on end? Whoever thought that in the United States of America, governors would rule with dictatorial powers for, for over a year? I mean, Emperor Cuomo's still doing it. Um, yeah, th- this this was an excuse to, to break all the rules because public safety. Um, and, you know, we got to be real careful that this wasn't a dress rehearsal. 